Forget what we were doing. This is really good. Uh, oh, Christ. Uh, Ooh. Uh, uh, this is not bad. Bar of soap. This is better than... This is, this is good. Oh, yeah. This is good. Yeah. Not bad. Not at all. Could you go over next to that side, please? Oh, certainly. Woo! Oh, I got him. Now, how we're doing? Yeah, let's put it right. Anytime you want, roll. Let's get that. Pace. Roll it, I guess. Yeah. Now we're going to roll. There should Wait. be some silence. Uh, no, Marty? Yes? Well, do you want us to roll now? Certainly. We're rolling, quietly. Sure, why not? We're rolling now. Are we rolling now? We have been for some time. We have been rolling for some time. We've As I suspected, you thought I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you knew from the way you were acting. <laughs> Oh, there's one, one I want to get to. So how much film do we have left in that? I don't know. Why don't you tell a story? Uh, well, how much film? First of all, tell me the story about the film. Two minutes left. Two minutes left. This is no, it'll never no, work no, for two no, minutes. No, no, no. George, you think it'll work for two minutes? Huh? You think we'll get the story in two minutes? No, no. I doubt it. No, no. I doubt it very much. No, no. No, no. no I doubt no it. Way. No I doubt way. It. How could you tell a Stephen Prince story in two, two minutes? Two minutes. I don't know. I lost $17 in Vegas. You lost $17? What is that? $17. Hello. Who the hell is that? Who is that? You better get well, it. No, you, George, somebody, you get it. Wait. You get it. Please. You get it. No, everybody sit down, please. Did we already got what? the pizza, right? We got the pizza. What is this? Hello. Oh, <laughs> 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 you still want to ask for a drink? <laughs> <laughs> You give up? You give up? <laughs> 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 Uh, you give up. up. All right. Uh, uh, who is he? <laughs> who is he? Who is he? I think it's a pizza man. The Italian crab. Uh, you give up? All right. Hang him. You give up? Hang him up. All right, Steve. You fuck. <laughs> you fuck. Oh, you fuck. Well, now that he's finally arrived. Steve? <laughs> Is this your quarter? Oh, Jesus. We dropped, this. We dropped the Pepsi Cola. Uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> sit down. <laughs> All right, now we can eat. Crew, all right, give me a kiss. Just a big, wet one. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh, Great, yeah. yeah. Just a second, let us yeah. make a little here. That's better. That's better. Uh, let's make some room over here. Just make a little room. Right. Make a little room this way. You give up? That's fine. You give up? Yeah, I give up. Steven, you son of a bitch.
You, <laughs> Scorsese. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> well, I think now that both of you are here, we can tell some stories. In uh, 1971, uh, I was working for Neil Diamond out here, and I, I, I had a couple of friends who uh, had a ranch, and we all went down there, and uh, we got ourselves a, some really great, great grass. I mean, great. It was good, huh? Fantastic. It was good. And it must have been about... Uh, 11 or 12 of us in a room, something like this, and we're sitting in there, and we're smoking, and we're smoking, and I, uh, I, right where this would be was a hallway, and it was from one room leading into the kitchen. It's like from the dining room leading into the kitchen. It was just, you know, that little space there. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just smoking away, and all of a sudden I see this black thing go by like that and I turned to the guy and I said uh, Charlie uh, you got a monkey here <laughs> and uh, he says no there, no there's no monkeys here no I said yeah I just uh, saw a monkey I, I just started to just walk by there he said no no that, that's Baba and I said what, that's, that's Baba he said, yeah that's Baba he says Baba come in here oh, Baba comes in Baba is a fully grown silverback Gorilla, 900 pounds, four and a half feet tall, right? Comes walking in, he's got a straw hat on, and he's wearing short pants, no. okay? All right? Really, really, he was toilet trained, he was toilet trained, and when, when you would go to him, when you would say, when you would say to him, I'm right, aren't I, Bubba? He would shake his head yes, he'd say, that's wrong, isn't it, Bubba? He'd grunt, shake his head no. Yeah, and it was it was like like the old story, you know, what is the girl asleep? Anywhere he wants to. You know, who's gonna bother that? Who's gonna bother him? And he just he was very frightening because he was just so human like, you know, and but he's big and strong. He he, took, he showed us one of his tricks. He took a Cadillac uh, tire and turned it inside out with his hands. That was a cute trick, I thought. You know, a steel, a steel, a steel belted radial tie. You he was know, at home, but um, just with the hands. Oh God! He was, he was taught that. These are things he was. Yeah, taught. yeah. Oh, he also was taught to straighten out a horseshoe straight. And gorillas have a thing that they're very clean, and they like to go through hair and take the ticks out, right? <laughs> and he sticks his hand, this girl's talking, she didn't know where he was, did he? he sticks his hand through her hair and starts looking for ticks. She went 40 feet in the air, <laughs> screaming, running out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're never seen, they're never seen again. <laughs> Once, I remember once on a Thanksgiving dinner, uh, we got a telephone call from uh, Texas, and uh, they had uh, built a brand new 16-inch cannon, 16-inch, took a 16-inch shell, you know, and it, they had built it, and they had put a, a round in the chamber, closed the chamber, and fired it, and it didn't go off. <laughs> And they didn't know what to do, and they called him up. And this is Thanksgiving meal, and he's sitting there on the phone. He said, well, let me, uh, what, did you try this? Did you try that? He said, you tried all those things, huh? He said, uh, you got a newspaper there? Okay, open the uh, breech door, stuff newspaper in around the breech door, slam the breech door closed, get yourself about 200 yards of rope, I on to the, to, the, to the cord, move way back, and pull it. And they move way back and pull it, and you could hear through the phone. Bang! <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that. And what it was was they designed it, and it was like a, the, the, the breech door didn't close a 32nd of an inch off, so the firing pin was missing by a 32nd of an inch. So when he put the newspaper in, it made perfect contact. They would call him up for little things like that. And uh... yeah. my mother, without a doubt, cooks the most land food in the world. 
No <laughs> taste at all. No <laughs> taste. This man is saying that about his mother. Right. <laughs> She was uh, she was really terrific, and she was a she was a st very strong lady. Uh, I can remember one uh, one <laughs> one winter, a blizzard. She had planted the tree when we first moved into this house, and now the tree was like you know twenty years old, and uh, it was just beautiful tree. And this blizzard was just ripping it up by the roots, and my father. My brother Ronnie, my brother Jeffrey, myself are looking out the window at the hurricane and watching the tree being torn up, and it was just terrible. And uh, my brother Ronnie looks out the window and he says, Look at that, there's somebody out there. Who's that asshole with their back hold, uh, holding the tree up? And my father said, That's no asshole, that's your mother. Get out there! Get out there, get a, get a block and tackle, get some rope! Go get that tree! And then my father went out there and stood in the middle of the hurricane and he was put a, put a line on that. Get a line over there, get some boards up under that. <laughs> My uncle, uh, he's uh, Abe Lastvogel. He uh, owns the William Morris Agency. And his older sister, Bessie, is my grandmother. And uh, she used to... Uh, she used to... Well, what kind of woman? She was just a real Russian Jew. She used to teach advanced ball busting 302 and uh, PhD ball busting. PhD? Uh, yeah. Oh. She was a ball buster from the word go. She cracked nuts from day to <laughs> night, and she was unbelievable. <laughs> and she, she was just, you know, when she'd take us out to dinner, uh, if the string beans were cold, send it back. You know, yeah, that kind of thing. The wine, you know, she she she, she taught me uh, to drinking wine, and she taste the wine, and she uh, taste it. It's no good. Break the case. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, she ran a paper company. Yeah. She ran a paper company till she was eighty four. Uh, she uh, was right in there all the time. And she was in the office, and darting through the fire escape comes this uh, thief with a gun. And he wanted the payroll. For the, for, he wanted the payroll that was in the safe for all the guys downstairs in the, in the paper mill. Uh -huh. And she's talking on the phone, and he says, All right, put down that phone, and don't anybody move. And she says, you just wait one minute. I'm talking to my daughter on the phone. And when I finish talking to my daughter, I'll get to you. Henrietta? Henrietta, I'm going to have to hang up now. I'm being robbed. On the phone. Is she still, she's still alive? She, uh, she, she's still alive. Uh, she, about a year ago, she got, had a stroke. And uh, she's uh, paralyzed and she can't talk. And... Uh, uh, I was 16, but I liked to uh, make money. Uh, I uh, had a, uh, an idea because um, the Great Neck area is uh, mostly Jewish people, and oh. Jewish people like to have uh, bagels on Sunday morning. <laughs> so I went over to Queen's Line and bought hot bagels and uh, for a very small amount of money and brought them into Great Neck and sold them for a very large amount of money <laughs> to the people in Great Neck, turning over quite a profit. And after a while, I had five guys working for me. I didn't even have to get up out of bed. They were doing the whole thing. I had a whole route and everything. What did he call what? What did, what did, you, what did you call your bagel business? Hot bagels. <laughs> well, well, I think on that note, we'll go on to thought. the next subject. There's something here about sailing, about an alcoholic skipper and a pitcher. I have, I have absolutely have no, no idea. idea what this story is. Yes, you do. No, just a second. Just a second. Just a second. I just want to read you what this says here. After a, a great deal of research we did in the whole thing, Steve tells about filling a pitcher with vodka. For the no, 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 I'm... I oh, I, 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 we, better, we better cut that out. Note to the editor. We better cut that out because it'll blow the ending of the uh, story. No, oh, it's okay, you want to tell the story? Uh, yeah. Uh, th this man, um, 
who was a really very good sailor, decided that he was he, he took us he would take us out and treat everybody. Uh, this was the Fourth of July, so it was a a big big thing, and he had a, a really big thing. He had a, a drinking problem, which I did not know about. He was an alcoholic, and everybody in his family knew about it, and they were all keeping the booze away from him. But I was his friend. I mean, I, I got some camaraderie going with the guy, and he said, Steve, come here. I want you to go downstairs, I want you to go in a foot locker, and I want you to get a, a pitcher that looks like water, put some ice in it, and put two bottles of vodka in there. <laughs> And bring it back up here, and I'll ask for some water. Okay, right? Did you? Yeah. I said, okay, right? And I said, I didn't know what I, I don't know. I went, okay. So uh, we're out there, and it's. Uh, uh, yes, Steve, would you give me some water? Down, bang, vodka, <laughs> back up there. And he's sitting in the back there, dunking these drinks down like this, and his wife and everybody else is up there getting the suntans and everything, and everybody, gee, Dad's doing great, and he's in the back. Why? <laughs> he's really having a great time, you know? And all of a sudden, it starts to get dark. And we're out there in the middle of Long Island Sound, and it's getting dark, and we don't know where we are. And his wife realizes, she goes back there, and she realizes, oh, oh hey, he's drunk. <laughs> Yo, Bob. He runs us right into a sandbar. <laughs> Grounded. OK, he says, all right, all right, uh, just everybody shut up. I don't want to take any more shit from anybody. All right, I will get us out of here. Goes down, goes, gets his his, his uh, special emergency kit out, takes his flare gun out. He's got 30 flares. Stands there, and every time a boat passes, he fires a flare. It's the 4th of July. Everybody applauds. <laughs> 40 flares. Not until the next morning did the Coast Guard tow us off. And his wife's going, you, bud. You, asshole. You know, I... <sighs> Tell Marty about that uh, cable what? that cable that started I, I, sparking? I, I don't think that that's... Uh, oh, come on, Stephen. You gotta that, be, that, 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 that was an accident. I had nothing We've, to do... Who died? I, who died? I, had, I had nothing to do with it. Now, wait a second, if the Steve. kid didn't play with the cable to begin with, he wouldn't have gotten electrocuted. Yeah, but... That oh, was an accident, oh, and I had nothing to do Steven, with it. I've always said that. I've always said it was an accident. It was in Tompkins Square Park. Oh. It was in Tompkins Square Park. It was when I was on the mobile tour in the Tompkins Square Park. Oh, yeah. And we had we had these uh, connectors that connect together like this, and we ran like uh, 2,000 feet of cable from the generator trucks. Yeah. And uh, some kid uh, pulled apart uh, two, two of the cables. Uh huh. And uh, we, when I saw the meters go down, I uh, ran immediately to see where the brake was. And we came running up on this kid, and he was standing against the metal fence with, in, a, uh, in a puddle of water. And he was holding it by the rubber, but he had pulled it out, and he had the two brass. You know, the brass was sticking up on both things like that. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, when in that neighborhood, their first instinct is to run, because they figured that you're, you're going to give them hell. And I said, listen, when, no one's going to hurt you. No one's going to do anything to you. No one's going to, you know, don't worry about anything. And he dropped one cable into the fence, and he dropped the other cable into the uh, oh, no. into the water. And it was a, a DC generator truck. So oh. it took me about a minute to get to the generator truck before I could hit the switch off. What happened? He fried. Oh, he's dead? Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Died. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was... The set we were putting up was Lady in the Dark, and I oh, was Lady and I was in charge uh, of a crew because I was the head tech student, and they would bring in union carpenters, and I had five union carpenters working under me, and I had to build the whole thing out on the side of the stage, 
okay? And I had the blueprints and everything, and they said, oh, this fucking kid, 18 years old, and we're gonna have to work under him. And I'm working, and I could work pretty fast. I could keep, I could keep going. I mean, I could go for a pretty long time. But I'm working now about 20 hours, and I'm getting tired, and I'm watching this guy, and he is moving along, and he's been working about 36 hours, and he's not a sign of tired. And I walk over to him, and I said, why, how can you do this? How can you, come on behind the scene doc here. Yeah. And I said, oh, okay, sure. He takes out a syringe, fills it up with pure methadrine, you know, crystal meth. Uh-huh. What is that? Uh-huh. That's, spe- that's <laughs> pure speed. Pure speed. Pure, speed. pure amphetamine. Oh. And he goes, on my leg like that, puts the shot in like that, and he goes, boom, takes the shot out, and, and, and walks away. And I'm standing by the scene doc, and I'm going, no, he didn't do that. I whip out on this thing, and I go, all right, you guys, it's the blueprints. I whip, I whip through my one assignment, and the head carpenter comes over to me, and he says, you really did that, was really great. I said, yeah, what else do you want me to do? Props? Props, lights, painting, what? What is it I want to do? You know, 72 hours I was running around like a, ma- a maniac. How much did you take? Uh, as much as he gave me. <laughs> Son, don't be home too late. Try to get back by it. Son, don't wait till the break of day. Cause you know how time breaks fades away, you know how time fades away. Oh, God, was I scared shitless. So what happened? Well, I had a plan, and uh, like I said, and uh, my father is a colonel in the army. I know the army. My brother is a second lieutenant. I know the way the army thinks, the way that they're set up. So I have my plan based on that. I went in. You take first. You take a uh, a mental test to see how smart you are, so they can place you in what field. I answered every question truthfully, but I just left didn't say yes or no to one question. Uh-huh. What was uh, that? One, the one question. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Uh, I gotta tell you. Uh, and then I took my physical examination. I passed the flying colors. Now, when you cause them a problem, you're immediately separated from the people who are going in and the people who are causing the problem. You are sent to the problem line. And I was sent to the problem line. And I was sent, and, and my case was reviewed by some second lieutenant, some 90 day wonder, you know? Guy was you know, about maybe two days older than I was. They knew nothing about the army, and he had the pass stamp, and he had the pass stamp, and I could read the word "passed" upside down as he went down, to, as he was going to go wonk on my paper. But he stopped because he said, "He said you have to answer this question," and the question was, "Have you ever had a homosexual relationship, and do you have homosexual tendencies, latent, latent homosexual tendencies?" And I said, I can't answer that question. I said, my, my father's a uh, colonel in the army. He's had a heart attack. Uh, my brother's a second lieutenant. I refuse to answer that question. He says, you have to answer that question. I said, I refuse. He said, I'm not. Now, then he calls his captain and the captain comes in. And he says, you have to answer that question. I said, I'm, I, I'm not going to refuse. The captain says, all right, we give you our word that only military personnel will have access to this file. I said, oh, you, your word, that's your word. He said, yes. I said, okay, yes, I have. He said, failed, leave, boom, boom, boom. One o'clock in the afternoon, I was out, I was out, I was it, out. One o'clock in the afternoon, and I got a four F, and they weren't giving four Fs then either. It wasn't sh- No, 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 he went at a different time, no. Oh. Because the rumor around town was that you named him as co-respondent. Yeah, I did. Ah. <laughs> I, did. I did. True. Yeah. You, then you did. Yeah, I named him. They asked you to you name the correspondent <laughs> of who you had the homosexual relationship with. Oh, God. And I said, yes. And, uh, <laughs> and their father. 
<laughs> then I was in New York, and uh, I was still working for the Shakespeare Festival at that time. Yeah. And I just finished up. We Hair just opened at the downtown theaters. I did the lights for Hair, and uh, then I went to work for Fred Weintraub, who I'd worked on and off for. You knew Fred a long time? I knew Fred a long time because he managed the Pickle Brothers. Ah. I knew Fred since I was 16. Fred would refer to me as his nemesis. I was made the night deposit for the, the, for the bit of rent in the Tin Angel. Oh, and he used yeah. to make it across the street in a bank. And this bank was in the middle of a whole city block. It was right in the middle. Nothing was on any side of it. You could see everything that went on there. You just had to open it and drop the, the thing in the box. That was it. There was nobody around or anything. And I used to carry a gun. I have a permit to carry a gun. And I carried a gun. It was freezing at night. I put my key in, pulled the thing down, went to drop the uh, night deposit in, and a knife came right there. Yeah. And I said, it's not my money. Take it. The guy took it, and he ran. He ran about 20 feet. And I pulled the gun out, and it was an automatic, and I cocked it, and he heard the metal slam home. And he just froze. And I said, don't move. <laughs> you scared the shit out of me. You move, and I'll kill you. <laughs> and, really. and, and, I, and I had him lie down on the ground, and then Jack the Cobb came. Jack the Cobb? Jack, Jack, the, Jack the Cobb? Jack the Cobb is, is the guy who's on uh, the, uh, the Bleecker Street. Uh, oh, yeah. The Bleecker Street That's route. Right. Yeah. Okay, and Jack comes comes over and he says, well, "What do you got here?" And he took he said he took the gun, he took my gun away, and he uh, I, I kind of, you know he released the ha a hammer and he put it back in my thing. He says, "What do you got here?" I said, "Guy robbed me." And he said, "I said uh, arrest him." He said, "No, look." He said, "If I arrest him, I'm gonna have to go downtown to fill out reports for 18 hours. I'll go around a corner, you shoot him." And this guy's laying down on the ground. Don't kill me! Don't shoot me! Yo, shoot him, and then the detectives will come, and they'll have to fill the reports out. And, and, and every time the guy started doing something, he hit him with the club. Quiet! I'm talking! Quiet, be quiet, boom! You shoot him, and then I'll come again. Quiet, boom! So then he finally just picked the guy up and arrested him oh, and made God. the collar. So what was, it, what was it like with drugs at this time? Was it uh, rough stuff yet? Uh, yeah, well, I was I was uh, starting to get into uh, uh, when I was working at the Tin Angel. I was uh, getting into uh, heavy drugs, pretty heavy drugs. I'd done it. I'd done it. Acid, and acid uh, didn't particularly interest me, and uh, cocaine did. You know, take take it or leave it. Grass or hash, but uh, heroin always interested me, and uh, I got. Uh, uh, yeah. Started uh, using heroin every once in a while. After a while, I got to use it. I guess as a, a crutch because uh, I would be high all the time. Yeah. And I was 21 years old, and I was road managing, and I was, you know, it was a big job. It was a big responsibility, and I had to deal with a lot of people who didn't want to know about me. I had to deal with promoters, 50 year old promoters. You had to deal with, you know, uh, stage managers. Guy after three times my age, they didn't want to know about me. And I would come on the stage, and uh, after a while, I had a reputation that don't even walk past him. <laughs> don't, 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 don't even talk to that person because he got, I agree. Fuck you! <laughs> Yo, fuck you! I can't, I can't have that dressing room? Well, let me tell you something, Father. You got 12,000 people out there, and they want to see Neil Diamond, right? He's not coming tonight. You're going to go out and tell him? I'll see it. They're going to rip this place apart. Goodbye. And this is, you're taking heroin with all that? You taking all yeah, I was taking it all, 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 all during that time. Uh, and I got into it very heavily. And that was terrible. like a how many year period when you were road managing? Uh, I was road managing for about two years, two years, two, three years there. Before that, I was a uh, tin angel. Yeah. But I, I was doing heroin for about five years. For about three of those years, it was... For two of those years, it was very heavy. It was like one, once every four hours. Huh. Uh, see, uh, I, when I scheduled plane flights for uh, Neil, 
Uh, no, the, nobody knew about this, but we never made a plane flight that lasted more than four hours. <laughs> We'd always make connections. They never figured it out. They didn't know. They figured, oh, well, Steve knows what he's doing. I mean, obviously he's in charge. He knows what's happening. We'd never be more than four hours. But what, what was it? You really functioned better and everything when you were managing all that? Carrying all that equipment and the shows per night, uh, back and forth. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Because there's no, it's, it's, it's um, an energy. It's, it's after, you're, after you're over the, the uh, you're into the initial of it as a life juice, yeah. it's like a tonne leaf. <laughs> right. It's like the, the mummy's leaf. tomb, yes. right? You know, you got a chorus must have the ton of leaf, you know, and it's it's a life juice, and, and you don't need that much sleep. You know, you need maybe two hours of sleep, and the rest of the time you're on the nod anyway. I mean, I had a house when I was working for Neil. Uh, I had a house up on, in uh, Marmont, and uh, then eventually uh, I was still living in the house when I kicked the kick dope. When I stopped doing it, and I was off dope for months, and uh, one day I walked into the kitchen, and I realized that the ceiling in the kitchen was painted green, because my eyes were never open that much <laughs> to see the ceiling. <laughs> I mean, I was like this. So did you ever get arrested or anything with that? Uh, 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 I was... Uh, uh, that's a long answer there. Uh, long, long, long pausing, day. long pausing. I was yes. involved, yes. I, I, no, I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't arrested. I had a friend who was a dealer. He was a very heavy uh, dealer yeah. in smack. And they could never pin smack on him. They could never pin heroin rap on him. But he'd taken some guy someplace and beaten him up. And he was an ex-prize fighter. So they uh, had warrants out for him for, a, you know, assault with a deadly weapon and kidnapping. And he met, he, he came to the house and he brought a kilo of heroin. And I put it in a uh, special spot, and I, a special place that I had built. I had built a special chest of drawers that was like Chinese and had a special bottom. This is when he was still road manager. Yeah. And... Uh, and then he came in and he went to sleep in the bedroom and I was watching television in the den and his girlfriend Betsy was there and we were expecting uh, two other people. So the doorbell rang and Betsy goes downstairs, she answers the doorbell and it's uh, the uh, entire narcotics squad for Hollywood coupled with the uh, federal agents. Uh. Fifteen of them. Fifteen of them. And they just... They put tape over her mouth, put a gun to her head. Then they, they snuck up the front bed, the staircase, and the back staircase. Now, leading into the, into the living room, television is where you are. I'm sitting here on the couch. Over there are those beaded curtains. Yeah. At a peripheral vision, I'm sitting there eating a box of Cocoa Jacks. I'll never forget it. <laughs> At a peripheral vision, I can see a 12-gauge shotgun and two 38s, you know, Right there, and I, and I turned over and I went. up in the air, and the guy went. Put, put your, you went like this, and put your hands on your head and sit over there, and I didn't. And they let the guy in the back. They let the guys in the back, and they all jumped. This one guy who was asleep, who they were after, uh -huh. and then he called me into the kitchen. This sergeant, I'll never forget that guy, boy. He called me into the kitchen, and he, and he said. Is there any, he, he, said, uh, he, he said, let me see your arms. He looked at my arms, showed the tracks. He said, um, now, I had, this is the first time it ever happens to you. And when it ha first time it happens to you, it's just such a, not a believable reality. He didn't say anything else to me. He didn't question me. He didn't talk to me about anything. He just said, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say, man, he just started reading me my rights. Yeah. I started to cry hysterically. And when I get hysterical, I have a, a thing in my nose, a bad vein, and I started to get a nosebleed that just wouldn't stop, and it started gushing down, and it was just all the way. And, and it ended up, I was laying on my bed, one policeman had a cold cloth behind my uh, back of my neck, 
another policeman had a tissue up my nose, and another one was saying, you're not going to jail, please stop crying. <laughs> please stop crying, you're not going to jail. You know, I mean, how could they bring in all these heavy dope deals with this kid? Bring, oh, 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 They handcuff him, handcuff his girlfriend, take him out. I go downstairs, I lock the door. I can see him down in the courtyard. They're packing their shotguns up in their cases. As they're packing their shotguns up in their cases, I'm breaking out the heroin. <laughs> uh, out of the drawers. And I'm, I was getting off before they were in the cars. <laughs> That I used to cop from this guy, Big. His name was Big. He was uh, he was a four foot uh, Negro. His name was Big. He had two sh uh, two toes shot off in Vietnam. He shot him off himself so he could get out. He was he was a he was a dealer. He was on 14th Street, and uh, we used to go down there. And I used to go in to uh, this this hallway that smelled from urine. Guys with urine in there, go up a flight of stairs, knock on the door. Yo, who's there? Steve! Steve who? Steve, your ass! Steve who? Oh, and you go in, and it was a shooting gallery. You'd go in and use his works, you'd buy the dope. Oh, I see. Right? Now, they had this couch in there. The couch was like this, only the back was broken down, and they had a uh, blanket over it. And uh, I come in when I come in one night, and uh, I'm, there's three guys ahead of me waiting to get off, and there's a guy getting off at the table, and these three guys are standing up against the wall, and uh, I see him stand there, and I look, and I see the couch, and I uh, sit down on the couch, just sit down there, and I mean, the second I sit down, all the eyes in the room snap on me. And uh, Big says, hey, you remember Joey? I said, yeah, sure, yeah, I know Joey. So we are sitting on him. <laughs> I said, oh, 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 yeah? The guy was dead. Oh, mm, that's, yeah, that's right. And then I just put the blanket down, and then I got back on the end of the line, you know. I mean, you wasn't going to lose my place in line. <laughs> <laughs> And but out of that, you uh, you know, out of close calls, uh, I managed to get a lot of um, medical supplies, medical equipment that you didn't normally have. Like we had oxygen, we had uh, an electronic stethoscope that maybe gave a tape readout so you could tell how many heartbeats. Yeah. We had adrenaline shots. We had uh, all kinds of stuff, to, to, the kind of shots to bring you through in your OD. And this girl uh, once OD'd on us, and she was out, man. And it was my fr myself and his and his uh, her boyfriend. And he said, uh, and her heartbeat was dropping down. And we got everything out, oxygen, and nothing was working. And he looked at me. And he says, "Well, you're gonna have to give her an adrenaline shot." I said, "What are you talking about?" He's, I said, you give it to me. He says, I can't. It's like a doctor working on someone in his own family. I said, that's bullshit. You've known her two days. What the fuck is that? You know, and he, and, and he said, no, I can't do it. And so I, I had, we had the medical dictionary. You know how you give an adrenaline shot? Okay, your adrenaline needle's like about that big, and you've got to give it into the heart. And you have to put it in a stabbing motion and then plunge down on a thing. I got the medical dictionary out looked it up, got a magic marker, made a magic marker where her heart was, measured down, <laughs> measured down like a, uh, two or three ribs, and measured in between there, and I just stood there and I went, huh! and then, uh, and she came back like that. She just came right back like that. So then what about Neil? What kind of relationship did you have with Neil, Neil Diamond? When he found out that, uh, that I was uh, pretty uh, heavily into heroin, which uh, it, it took, uh, I mean, he was like the last to know. Uh, uh, 
just just because I kept it pretty cool from him. Some of the other people in the band knew, but he was like the last to know. And he uh, he did a very. Uh, I was really at that point at the peak of being into dope, at the peak of the high. He came to me and he said, "Listen, I'll put you in a hospital. I'll take care of all your hospital bills, and when you come out." I'll help you get started in anything you want to do. Uh, would you consider doing that? And, uh, of course, I thought it over and made the really intelligent decision. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> then I worked for him for a couple of more months, and then he stopped performing. He so, went on a vacation. Did anybody talk to you about it or say anything? Yeah, I, uh, I spoke to him a couple of times about it. <laughs> Uh, I remember one time I, I spoke to you about it, Stephen. I was telling him, what, are you crazy? Are you out of your fucking mind? What the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? You, you want to kill yourself? Is that what you want to do? You want to go out that way? And Stephen says to me, that's not a bad way to go. I mean, you just get higher and higher and higher. And higher, and higher, and higher, and higher, and higher. And you just fly away. Yeah. Because I, I really can't think of, uh, I mean, there's no, there's no nice way to go, you know, but if someone was to come up to me and say, uh, sorry, you leave at three, I'd say, well, how about uh, going out on smack? <laughs> Did the whole school close down? No changeovers, everything. And everybody had to go home. Everybody had families. I had no place to go. Yes. And I wasn't about to go back to New York. So I had a friend who was uh, working, uh, whose father had a brand new gas station about uh, 10 miles outside of Barstow. And uh, he said that the, there was no. Outside of where? Barstow. Barstow. And uh, he, he said that. There's a guy there who's taking off for Easter vacation. So if I wanted to make some extra money during Easter vacation, I could take over that, jo that job, you know, working in a gas station. I figured it's a good idea. So I went out there and I went, went with the guy, and uh, I worked in a gas station. Now, I worked alone from the hours of 10 at night until 2 in the morning. So my, my hours were 8 to 4. But there were other guys on during those times. But from 10 to 2 in the morning, I worked alone in this gas station. And uh, I'm in the gas station. I'm in this little, this little office. It's about uh, that big, you know? Mm. About that big around. There's all, only room is in there for the cash register and a chair. And I'm sitting in a chair, and I'm sleeping. I mean, I'm really, I'm 40 winks, I'm out. And I hear a noise. So I get, a, I get up, get up out of the chair, and I walk out onto the, there's a little stoop, you know, on, so you step down. And I look out, and I look down way at the other end of the gas station, 50 yards. It's one of those big, huge, super big gas stations. 50 yards down there, we had these tire racks with the chains that went through the tire racks. Okay, there's an Econoline van down there. And this guy's got these, had these chain cutters. And he's cut the chains. And he is packing this Econoline van with, with uh, tires. He had every inch of that van that you could possibly imagine filled with tires. He had the last two tires that he was going to put in. The last two tires, he was just about to put them in, then he would have closed the door and driven away. Just as he's about to put this thing in, I, I, I go, Hey, you! <laughs> the guy turns around. He's half Indian, he's half Mexican. He was zonked out of his mind on speed. He's got no T-shirt on, he's sweating. He's got a knife in here. That's about a 14-inch knife. Pulls the knife out. Where he is, I'm standing still, rubbing, this, rubbing the sand out of my eyes, 
pulls the knife out and goes, ah! and starts running at me. Running at me, right? And I'm standing there, and I'm looking at this man running across the, at top speed with this knife in his hand. And the only thought that came into my mind was, wrong. This is definitely wrong. And I walked, in, I walked into the, to the, to the office, walked into the office, uh, right behind the cash register, the uh, owner kept a 44 Magnum, mm -hmm. a six shot, right? I turned, I cocked it, turned around, and the guy was just coming through the door. Just coming through the door, the, the, the doorway. And just as he was coming through the door, I fired. And I hit him right in the chest. And as fast as he came in that door, <laughs> he went out, okay? I blew him out past into the pumps. I blew him between ethyl and regular. Seriously, he was out there. He was out there some between ethyl and regular. Now the guy must have been, he, cause he had the knife out and he, the blood was just down the front of, of him like this. And it was a hole in his chest you could have driven a truck through. But he was on speed or something because he uh, made a, like a last nervous move up off the pumps to come at me like that. At which point, I just took the revolver and emptied it in him, blowing him out of the gas station. Six, six shots with a 44 Magnum. Then I went on the phone and I called the highway patrol and I told them I just killed a man. And, and I hung up and I said, where and I hung up. And I went, then I went and I sat down in a little chair in front of the gas station. And in the desert, before you could hear the sirens, you could see the lights, red flashing lights, blue flashing lights, green flashing lights, helicopters flashing, you know, and they came in, <laughs> riot squad came in, and I was still sitting, I was still sitting out on the porch with, with a gun in my hand. Some sergeant came up, you know, he had, a, he had the gun on me at all times, his gun on me, but I was just sitting there in shock. I was completely in shock. He took the gun out of my hands and they took me to the hospital. And then I had to be, uh, examined by three psychiatrists for the, after the coroner's inquest. Now, the guy was wanted. He was uh, escaped from some, you know, detention camp or something. He's, he was a, a rapist, a known rapist. Not important. Mm -hmm. But uh, at, at any rate, they uh, made me go through three days of examinations. And the main, the main question on their minds was why did I shoot the man six times? <laughs> because obviously the one shot killed the sucker. And I said, I said I don't, I didn't, I, which I didn't, I did, I did not remember the other five shots. I said, boom, 25 yards outside, out of the, out of the, yeah, out of, out of, right out, of, right out of the station. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was and what a, a wonderful way to spend my Easter vacation. Did you did you ever think of as about why you shot him six times? Yeah, because I mean I, I had the, the experience of just shooting him that one time. I mean, ever sh just sh shooting a man. I mean, yeah. you know, the experience of doing that and seeing him staying there bleeding. It was. I mean, I was completely intense anxiety, I was shaking. And then he got up like he was going to move towards me. And uh, my father always taught me, never aim a gun at anybody. Never ever aim a gun at anybody, unless you're going to shoot him. And if you're going to shoot him, kill him. Would you mind pointing that gun in another direction? <laughs> don't, ever let, don't ever let him get up again. Yeah. If he gets yeah. up, he's going to kill you. And he got up. What would you think? What did you really think when you, when he was coming at you, though? When he was coming at me? Yeah. Uh, I, before, I, before I squeezed the trigger, when he was coming through the door, yeah. I could see the sweat off of him, and I could see his eyes. And his eyes were just glass. I mean, you, the, I'll, never, I'll never, ever forget the expression of those, that guy's eyes. It was just, I mean, he had written all over him, 
I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> with, <laughs> while holding I'm, the knife. I'm going to cut you up six ways from Sunday and mail you. Jesus. I mean, that was, that was strictly, you know, that's when, that's when reaction has to take over. When survival has to take over. You've got to, at that point, have to make the decision. So I, that was, was my, my Easter vacation. What's the relationship now with uh, family life, your parents, your wife, and so on and so forth? My, uh, yeah, well, uh, my, my, my position with my family is, um, like, my father, uh, I was speaking to my father just the other day, and uh, he... Uh, I, I could tell him, I mean, he always knows that I'm, I'm, I'm a survivor, you know, I'll get through anything. He knows that I can hack at doing just about anything. Uh, so he's not worried about that, but uh, he, asked, he asked me if I was enjoying what I was doing. And I said, yeah, I am enjoying what I'm doing. And he said, but that's, that's good. I, I told him that I finally thought that I'm doing something now that... I've worked up to do, wanting to do. Well, okay. Uh, can we cut one second? Line? What I want to do is I want to, do, I want to ask you about your father again on the last telephone call again. It seemed very matter of fact. It just seemed a little too objective to me. I don't know. It just seemed, you know, because when you told it to me on the plane, it was a little more, a little more uh, sincerity to it. I don't know. It was just, it just seemed thrown away this time. Because I don't quite understand. Was that the whole conversation? No. The whole thing we tell you, I mean, your relationship with your parents is what, like, now. your father is always... Yeah, all right. Oh, I, see, I see what you... Yeah, all right, yeah. Explain a little about what Right, right, saying. right, right. Yeah. Uh, so, what's your parents? Uh, their reaction to now? Their reaction to now. My mother's reaction to now is that um, I'm out here, I'm in Hollywood, and I'm making movies, and that's great for her. My father's reaction is my father's dying of uh, a heart. He's got uh, fatal uh, heart disease, and he's dying. And I have a very hard time talking to him on the phone. And he said to me, I know that you're a survivor and that you can do good in whatever you do, but are you having fun? And I said, yeah, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I really like doing what I'm doing. And I said happy. I said, are you having fun? Just try it that way. It's perfect. I just want to hear down the other way. But are you happy? But are you happy? That's all. Same way? Yeah. Okay. So when he spoke to him before, what did he say? He said, uh... Okay, wait a second. So, your parents, your parents' reaction to your father... My mother's reaction is that she's very happy at what I'm doing here. And my father's reaction is she's, he's uh, dying of uh, heart disease. And uh, I have a hard time relating with him sometimes. And he called me on the phone and he asked me, well, he said to me, I know you're a survivor and I know you can do well in whatever you do, but are you happy? And I told him, yeah, I was happy. <laughs>